Greetings, Saxon Algebra 2, Lesson 2. Ta-da, we're finally gonna do some straight algebra, you guys. We're gonna start by talking about negative exponents. Negative exponents mess everybody up because they think that it means like a negative number, but it doesn't. It has a whole weird definition that you just have to wrap your head around. This sign means flip it. It means take the base and the exponent and flip them down. Remember, I think of this as a trapeze bar. I don't know how to spell trapeze. I don't think that's right. Um, but in any case, I always think of it as a trapeze bar. The guy takes this fraction and he flips it down, just like, you know, the trapeze guys flip around as they fly from bar to bar. So it just flips it down. When we see a negative sign in our exponent, we can immediately change it to this and just to blow your mind further, if you have a negative exponent in the denominator, we flip it up to the numerator. So put this in the cover where you're keeping your formulas and definitions. And remember that there's nothing necessarily logical about this notation. That's just the way we have all agreed to handle it. Okay, let's do some examples. Ready? There are four parts to this one. We're simplifying. So the first one is 1 over 3 to the minus 2. Okay, that looks like this, doesn't it? So that means we flip it up from the denominator up to the numerator. So that becomes 3 squared, and that becomes 9. Notice that when I make the flip on the trapeze, when I flip it up from denominator to numerator, the minus sign goes away. It does not exist anymore. So it's gone. This is A. Let's do B. And notice also that I don't try to simplify the number until I get the minus sign taken care of. Okay, this is our original format. So it's in, if you think of it as in the numerator now, we're gonna flip it down to the denominator. The minus sign burns off in the flip, and now I can simplify it. Three cubed is 27. So that's my final answer. C, I'm gonna use my extra space here. C is minus three to the minus two. Oh, okay, so now we have a minus sign out here. Well, that means something altogether different than that minus sign. And the first thing we do is we see that is not protected by parentheses, so we're gonna cover it up, right? We can cover it up if we can. Now we simplify this. It is in the numerator, so we flip it down to the denominator. Copy the exponent, but burn off the minus sign. Now we can simplify that. Now that we have all of that cleaned up, there's a minus sign, so we put the minus sign back. So the answer here is minus one ninth. That's correct. D. Okay, minus three to the minus two. Okay, this minus sign is protected by the parentheses, so we can't cover it up like we did that time. So that we just have to leave that B and keep it connected to the three. We turn our attention to this and say, okay, that means flip it one over, and then I'm gonna keep this exactly the same, put the exponent there, and I've burned off the minus sign. All right, now I can calculate this this would be minus three times minus three, right? Because that minus sign is connected to the three. So that becomes positive nine. So this final answer is one over nine, and that's a positive answer. These get pretty tricky, don't they? And here's one more. I'm gonna turn the page. I'm not gonna try and squeeze it in. My chair creaks whenever I stand up to check and make sure my book's still in frame. E, negative, negative three to the minus three. Oh, don't you just wanna cry? All right, the first thing we do is cover up anything we can cover up. I can cover up that one. 
Then we'll take care of the trapeze. We'll flip it down so that becomes one over minus three cubed, right? I burn up this as I flip it. This comes along for the ride. That one's still hiding. Now I can simplify this one over. Now I remember when there's a minus three, that means I'm actually cubing the minus sign two. So I know that three times three times three is 27. And all of these minuses, one, two, three of them, that's an odd number. So that stays minus. But I have that minus sign. So that makes this go back to positive. So my final answer is one over 27. This is, as I'm sure you can intuit, the hardest of all these combinations. So, you're welcome. That's my little gift to you today, is a hard problem like that. They're hard, but if you just go step by step and remember what each minus sign means, you'll be fine. Okay, let's talk about the rules for exponents. If you have worked with me before, you know I'm obsessed with these rules for exponents. If you haven't worked with me before, then just buckle in because I love this chart and I use it all the time. And I think the reason why is that when I was taking algebra, nobody ever wrote it out like this before for me. They just talked about it and I couldn't really wrap my head around how these rules related to each other. And I just kind of had to feel my way through it. And that is not a good feeling. Okay, there are three rules for exponents. One is called the product rule. One is called the quotient rule. And one is called the power rule. Those sound like weird hard words, but this one means multiplying, this one means dividing, and this one means putting an exponent on it. When you see the other part, you'll, it'll make a little more sense. So let's say we've got a number, a base, if you will, and it's got an exponent on it, and we're multiplying it by the same base with a different exponent. The way we can simplify those is to add the exponents. Okay, so when we're multiplying, thus the name product that involves multiplying, we add the exponents. What about if we have a base with an exponent on it and we're dividing by the same base with a different exponent? Dividing, thus the word quotient. In this case, we subtract the top exponent minus the bottom exponent. Okay, so that's the second rule. The third rule is let's say that we've got a base with an exponent on it, and we want to raise it to an even higher power. Thus the, word, the power rule. And in this case, we multiply. These are the rules for exponents. They are rules we're gonna use a million times, and then a million times more. And when you see them laid out like this, they can be relatively simple. Please, right now, pause me and copy this into your notebook cover so that you have them handy. I'm gonna talk about them endlessly. So, you know, welcome to my world. Let's pause me and do that and then we'll work a couple problems showing them. Okay, you're back and we're ready to tackle example 2.2. And the instructions tell us to simplify and then it gives us a big long line of bases and exponents. The hardest part is copying these directly out of your book. In the beginning, I want you to copy them. As we go forward, I'll give you some shortcuts so you don't have to waste your life copying problems out of your math book. I'm going to copy though, so you can see.
Okay, I'm just double checking to make sure I copied right. That's one of my uh, most common sources for making mistakes in my problems is that I copied it wrong. So I double check and make sure that looks pretty good. Okay, now we see some negative exponents up here. We just talked about how those are trapezes and we flip them, but we're not gonna start with that. We could, it wouldn't be wrong to do that, but we're not gonna flip them because we can use our rules for exponents in a problem like this when they're still in their negative form. So it's fine to do it that way. The other thing that we need to remember that I don't know that we've talked about is this very simple rule. And that is that, oh, a cat's coming over to say hi to me. Hi, Luna. He's climbing up. Oh, here he comes. He's in frame now. Hello. Do you want to lie in my math book? He often does. It's a black cat, so it probably just looked like a blur went across the screen. Okay, um, anything raised to the zero power equals one. So when we're multiplying something and we see a zero power, we can just cross it off because multiplying by one doesn't change anything. The other thing that we need to remember is that if we've got a number that doesn't have an exponent on it, we can put one on. The number we put on is a one. Okay, so this Y, for example, I'm gonna put a one on that. Hi, wonton, I know you wanna be petted. He doesn't care about how to put exponents on base numbers that don't have exponents. He doesn't care at all. Okay, but you need to go. Lovely, you can sit on my lap. Okay, so I added a one here because I'm gonna to wanna to use those rules for exponents in just a minute. Now, our next step is to combine these guys using the product rule for exponents, which is when we're multiplying two bases that match, they have to match, we can add the exponents, okay? So that is the product rule that I'm putting into play here. These two rules are helping, these three rules are helping us solve our problem. So what I'm gonna do, I've got X's and Y's mixed together. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start by looking at the X's and I'm gonna add up all of the exponents. So I've got a two, and I'm gonna add, oh look, there's a minus five. I don't let that bother me, I'm adding it. And then here's a positive five. So when I add those all together, I get positive two, because those guys cancel, right? And then I do the same thing for my y's. I just pull the exponents off of them and add them. And I don't let the negative numbers throw me, I just add it as a negative number and that equals minus three. So with these two calculations, I can say that my final answer, the simplified version of this is x squared y to the minus three. These numbers represent the exponents for those bases. That's my final answer. Yay, it's right. We'll be doing a lot of this. We're gonna do some more in this next problem. Example 2.3, here we go. Copy it down, I see here's one without an exponent, so I'm gonna put that one on there so I don't overlook him. And then this one has a denominator. checking. Beautiful. Looks good. You've got it. Now, this one we see not only has multiplication, but also division. So we're going to use two of our 
rules for exponents. We're going to use the multiplication one again, where we add, but we're going to also use the quotient rule, where we subtract. And here's what we're going to do. <clears throat> we're going to clean up the top, we're going to clean up the bottom, and then we're going to combine them. All right, so we'll use the product rule first to simplify within each level, and then we will smoosh them into one single expression. Maybe it'll be a fraction, maybe it won't, but it'll be simplified. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do this same process that I did here where I'm gonna take the exponents from one letter and add them, the exponents for the other letter and add them. I'm gonna do it on the top and the bottom, and I'm gonna do it in my head this time. I'm not gonna write it out like this because there aren't so many in each place. <clears throat> so I'm gonna start with the X's in the numerator. There's four minus 10, so that's gonna be minus six. And I'm gonna cross them off as I do them so that I don't, um, I, I can make it a little bit easier for myself. <clears throat> Okay, then I'm gonna do the Y's. I like to always go alphabetically because it's easier for me to keep it as organized as possible so that I don't get confused and forget to do something. John doesn't always go alphabetical. I highly recommend it. As we go on in this course and then on into the next course, problems are just gonna get more complicated and anything you can do to help you keep yourself organized and remember what the heck you're trying to do the better off you'll be. So let's go alphabetical. Okay, one minus three is minus two, plus five is positive three. Okay, so now I've combined the matching bases in my numerator, and I'm gonna do the same thing in the denominator. I'm gonna start with the x's. Minus three plus two, that's a minus one. And then I'm going to do the y's. Minus six plus 10, that's positive four. Okay, cool. So now I've simplified this, simplified this, but I still see I've got top to bottom I can do. That's where our quotient rule comes in. So for the x's, now I'm gonna go to a more uh, written out explanation just so you see. I've got my top, exponent, and then I'm going to subtract my bottom exponent. They both happen to be negative. That's okay. I just have to deal with negative numbers. So minus 6 plus 1 equals minus 5. And then y, it's 3 minus 4. Those are both positive. So that's negative one. So my final answer to this problem will be x to the minus five, y to the minus one. Now, you might look at that and say, but that has negative exponents in it. Shouldn't you write it as, here, let me write it the other way x to the minus five, y to the minus one. That is what I'm saying is the right answer. That is what John is saying is the right answer. That may bother you. You could write it as one over x to the fifth, y to, y to the positive one. Sorry, that shouldn't be there. That is perfectly fine. Or you know what else you could do? You could leave the x on top and put the y on the bottom, or you could put the y on top and put the x on the bottom. Any one of those solutions is equally valid and equally correct. Negative exponents aren't necessarily our enemy. John will often tell us in the problem how he wants to see the answer. Like he might say, write your answer with all the digits in the, with all the variables in the denominator, or he might say, write them all in the numerator. Follow his instructions. If his presentation looks different than yours, just check to make sure that you can get to his 
um, accurately. But this is the way this answer is shown. Okay, now we're ready to do one more problem. And this time, we're gonna use all three rules, the product, the quotient, and the power rule. This is getting even crazier. Copying first. Okay, the first thing we wanna do is take care of all of these exponents on exponents, okay? So we wanna use the power rule first in this case. Uh, in the last problem, first we used the product, then we used the quotient. That's the most, that's the most straightforward, the cleanest, simplest way to do it. If you went in an opposite order, you could still get the right answer, but this is the easiest way to do it. With these, where we have exponents, we are going to take the care, use the power rule first, and just to remind you of that, that's when we multiply the two exponents. Now, the notation is important. This exponent only relates to this base. It doesn't relate to that one. The parentheses control where the exponent goes. So I'm gonna start a new line. I'm gonna squiggle this so I can see. So this is now the next version. So this X stays the same. I'm gonna put a one on it. This, we're gonna multiply and get negative six right there. This Y stays the same, he gets a one. Now, this one's tricky because this exponent relates to the Y, but both of them are inside the parentheses. So it becomes X, this has a one on it, X to the minus three, Y to the positive six. See how I did that? I'm distributing that minus three and multiplying it to the basis. Okay, now before we go any further, I wanna, oh no, I'll do the same thing on the bottom. Okay, so this is the, the power rule, I'm applying that. Now on the bottom, we have to be careful again. This relates, relates to that, so that's y to the sixth. This y to the minus three stays, and then we multiply three times two to get x to the sixth. This is a great time to stop and check and make sure you got it right. So that's what I'm gonna do. X, X to the minus six, Y, X to the minus three, Y to the six, Y to the six, Y to the minus three, X to the six. Okay, beautiful. So I used the power rule and it all turned out fine. Second step, and we're gonna go in the same order because now our problem looks like the last one. The next step is I'm gonna use the product rule. And again, I'm not gonna write it out like I did last time, I'm going the very first time rather, I'm going to add them in my head. So I'm gonna start with x. One minus six is minus five, minus eight. Notice that I'm exaggerating my digits and making them really big so I can see. Just make sure that your exponents look like exponents and not like bases. So mine's big, but it's floating up super high. Now I'll do my y's. Notice that I put the ones in on the bases that don't have an exponent otherwise so that I can include them well. One plus six is seven. Now I'm gonna do the denominator I created, alphabetical, x, there's only one, so that's easy. And then this becomes six plus minus three is three. And I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna check this answer too. Minus eight, positive seven, x to the sixth, y to the third. John does not always go alphabetical, so be careful as you check them. He went, he put these alphabetical, but then he flipped those. It's so much easier if you just go alphabetical, John. I really wish you'd fix that. Okay, and then our last step I'm gonna put here is the quotient rule. And here, what we're simply doing is combining um, 
top and bottom we're subtracting. So this is going to become x to the negative 14, right? Because it's minus 8 minus 6. And then this will become y to the 7 minus 3 is 4. So this is my final answer. I wrote this answer with both bases in the numerator. Now let's check our answer. I go to look at the answer and I see, oh, John wrote this. He wrote y to the fourth over x to the 14th. So my question is, is my answer the same as John's answer? So I compare them and I see, oh yeah, what he did was he just moved this down to the bottom, burned off the trapeze, so he has x to the 14 in the bottom. So I'm happy with my answer. It matches to John's. I can easily get from mine to his. I don't need to change it. I can mark that correct. Um, if you weren't, sometimes it takes a couple steps to get from your answer to John's. Show the work, but you don't have to change your answer. This is perfectly fine. All right, enough about the power rule. We have one more short topic with two problems. I'm sorry, this is going on longer than I thought. It's part D. It's called circle relationships. These problems often throw students into a tizzy, but I'm here to tell you they're easy. The area of a circle is pi r squared. The circumference of a circle is pi 2 r. That's what you need to know to make these work. There we go, okay? Um, Example 2.5. The area of a circle is 12.2 meters squared. The area of a circle is 12.2 meters squared. John wrote this out in a sentence. I just wrote it in a formula. What is the circumference? Okay, so we're supposed to find this. The way to do this, the connection between these two formulas is radius. This is super important to understand. If you've got one of these measures, you work backwards to find out what the radius is and then you use the radius to solve the other problem. Okay? So we are we're going to go in this one. We're going to go from the area of the circle we're gonna find the radius, and then we'll use the radius to find the circumference of the circle. That's a circle, it's not an O. Okay, maybe I should do this. So you can see it's a circle. Okay, I'm not gonna do that in the future, but I want you to see that's not an O or a zero. Okay, so how do we use this to find the radius? Because that's our next step. We know that this is the answer to this formula, so we can say that 12.2 equals pi r squared. Make sense? This is the answer, that's the formula. I don't know the radius, but I'm gonna solve it backwards. I wanna divide both sides by pi. I can show it as a symbol, that gets it out of there, and then I can go over here 12.2 and say let's divide that by 3.14 because that's the value of pi, right? Pi equals 3.14. It actually equals a whole lot more, but for our purposes, we're going to round to two digits. In college, you'll probably use four digits. That's what I did. But for now, we're fine. Okay, so... Now we have to divide in order to simplify here, right? We switched the symbol for the digits. We need to bump this twice. That's how you deal with decimals and long division. Now we need to multiply. I can see three times four is 12, but once I multiply this by four, it's gonna be greater than that, so I'm gonna to have to go with three. Doing the long division is the hardest part of these problems. 3 times 4 is 12. 
3 plus 1 is 4. 3 times 3 is 9. I subtract. Remember that for doing just basic long division like this, there are, when we're dividing, we estimate. Oh, I don't, didn't leave myself enough room. We estimate, we multiply, we subtract, and we bring down. That is the algorithm or the pattern of steps that we repeat over and over to make long division work. It is super easy to forget and it's a million times easier to grab your calculator and punch in the numbers, but we are Sparta. We do not resort to calculators, you guys. We are tougher, stronger, and better than that. So we do it by hand and we're better human beings because of it. That's our process. So I estimated, I multiplied, now I need to subtract. I've got some borrowing I need to do. There's eight. If we were together in real life, I would be making you do the heavy lifting there. Um, I'm just thinking. After that whole diatribe, I may have you use your calculator for this because not only do we have to divide this by 3.14, but then we have to take the square root of that. And taking square roots and getting decimal numbers is not something we can do in our heads. So let me show you what you would do on your calculator. You would take 12.2, enter that. Then you would divide it by 3.14. You'd hit equals and then you'd hit square root. And the answer you would get is that the radius is equal to 1.97. So we are Sparta, we are tougher than that, but sometimes you just need a calculator to get a decimal version of a square root. So that's what we find for our radius, yay. You have permission to use, my, to use your calculator on these. Um, and now we take the radius and we solve it for the circumference. There it is, so it's 3.14 times two, times 1.97. And when we multiply that out, which you can do by hand, you don't have to result, resort to your calculator. I do put those two together and I do that 6.28 and then I'd multiply those together, but it will be 12.38 and our unit is meters. Circumference is the measure of length, right? Because it's the distance around. It's not an area, so we don't need to square that. That's the final answer, okay? The important thing I want you to gather in this one is that we can go from area to circumference by finding the radius. And in the last problem, example 2.6, we're going to just go in the opposite order. Whoops, 2.6, which is actually easier because we don't have to deal with the squares. The circumference of the circle equals eight pi centimeters. And we're supposed to find the area. So this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna start with the circumference of the circle. We're gonna solve that to find the radius. And then we'll use that to find the area of the circle. Circumference is two pi r and in this case, it's equal to eight pi. John told us that, that's the answer. This is the formula, that's the answer. So we're gonna divide by two pi in order to isolate that. Right, so this all cancels, that cancels, and we get that the radius is equal to four, eight over two. Oh my gosh, that is a million times easier than the last one, wasn't it? Now we need to take this and we need to go to the area. Let me just write these again. Circumference equals two pi r. I like you to have your formulas on every page. You don't have to write it in every problem if you're using it again, but I like to see it on the page because that way it's right in front of you. The area equals pi r squared. All right, and so the area equals pi times the radius squared, 
which equals 16 pi. Now this is a great example. Let me put the unit on it, it's centimeters. This is a great example of an alternative way to solve the problem. In this example, John is saying, we're not even gonna multiply through by 3.14. We're just gonna leave the symbol pi there. And anyone who looks at this will know you have to multiply this number by pi in order to get the precise value. But this saves us a lot of wear and tear. Look how easy this problem was compared to the last one because we didn't multiply through. It was also just easier numbers, but this is important to know that sometimes John will leave the pi symbol in the answer, other times he will multiply through. Check the solutions manual to see which type of answer he wants, decimals or pi. Check first and then make your answer correspond. Doing it both ways has value. Um, and I want you to be comfortable with either leaving pi in or taking it out and multiplying through. Um, so know what you're doing with all of those. Okay, that is the end of lesson two. Let me just remind you that we've switched back to the format we'll be using all year where you watch the lesson and then you just do the practice and the odds and then that's all, no evens anymore, okay? So this is the second lesson that I'm dropping for you on Monday. I will drop you two more lessons on Wednesday to get you through the rest of the week. You don't necessarily have to do them on these days, but make sure you're developing a nice rhythm, a nice schedule so that you're getting your homework done with the minimum of drama to your life. Math is super important, you guys. I'm not gonna pretend it's not. Not because I said so, but because the world of colleges and after high school experiences says that if you can do math, you're smart. My job is to teach you how to be smart in the most effective and efficient way because I know you've got a life beyond this. I know. It breaks my heart sometimes, but I know you do. Okay, that's lesson two. I will see you again on Wednesday with lessons three and four. Good luck and goodbye.